You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome to a Bible answer. I'm Mike McDaniel, evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. And I serve as the moderator for this television program. We're so glad that you're watching today and we hope you'll tell other people about it. We have three gospel preachers with us who will be answering your questions today. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. I'm Gary Colley, evangelist of the Getwell Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee. My name is Jimmy Colvett. I preach for the Church of Christ in Matthews, Missouri. My name is David Gulledge, and I preach for the Whitlock Church of Christ in Paris, Tennessee. We're grateful to the, each of these brethren for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us. Let's get right to our questions today. Our first question goes to Brother Gary Colley. We've had a person write in with this question. They said, what about those in the Christian church that were baptized for their mission of sins, but have only attended the Christian church? Some believe they're saved, but erring. Others say one cannot be taught wrong and baptized right. What is the truth on this matter? We'll give that to you, Brother Colley. Thank you, and we do appreciate your question. And certainly we want to be as kind as we know how in answering those things which you've asked. The Christian church has claimed for itself to be a denomination. A denomination means a part of something. If you have a quarter, that is a part of a dollar. And so that is not a dollar, but it's just a part of a dollar. In this denominational body called the Christian church today, they have instrumental music for which they have no authority. They have women preachers for which they have no authority. They also believe in uh, the Christian Missionary Society for which they have no authority. This is what a denomination is. It is that which is according to the doctrines of men, not according to the doctrines of God. We may be baptized into a denomination or we may get in by votes, but we're still in a denomination. And if it claims to be a denomination, it cannot be the Lord's body. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he said, For by one spirit were we all baptized into the one body. In Ephesians 4, he said, There is one body, one spirit, as you, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is Father of all and who is above all and through all and in you all. So we understand, my friends, that the one body is the church that Jesus purchased with His blood and built with His teaching. He said to Nicodemus in John 3, 3 through 5, Except a man be born again, he can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the kingdom of heaven and the church are one and the same. In Matthew 16, 18, and 19, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, loosed upon earth shall be loosed in heaven. When we're baptized for the remission of sins in harmony with the will of God, we're added to the church. That is the church of Christ. The only one was known in the New Testament. You know, some of these in the first Christian church say we are progressives. Progressive is a word that means going beyond that which is written. That's what 2 John 9 through 11 means. When he said, whosoever goeth onward or beyond, and abideth not in the doctrine of God, he hath not God. But he that abideth in the doctrine, he hath both the Father and the Son. And if any man come unto you and bring not this doctrine, do not invite him into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deed. Now in Acts 2.41, on the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church, they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the Lord added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. Verse 47 said they were praising God, had favor with all the people. 
And the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. What church did he add them to? Well, my friends, to honestly answer that, there was only one, and that was the church that Jesus built. Have you obeyed the gospel and become a part of that institution? In 1 Corinthians 1, 10, Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together of the same mind and of the same judgment. It's been declared unto me by those of the household of Chloe that there are contentions among you. And this I mean. One saith, I am of Paul. Another, I am of Cephas. Or I am of Apollos. Or I am of Christ. Listen to this, friend. He said, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, save Crispus and Gaius, lest you should say that you were baptized in my name. When we're baptized, it has to be into the body of Christ. By one spirit were we all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. So the Spirit's teaching teaches us to be buried in water, to wash away our sins, and thereby we can understand only those who do that can possibly claim to be saved. I would not take a chance on saying, well, I was baptized into a denominational body, but I'm a member of the Lord's church. That's hard to believe. Thank you for the question, and we hope that you have a better understanding. Thank you. Brother Colbert. The person says, my anxiety is affecting my health, my family, and my work. Where do I turn? Brother Colbert. Thank you for this very important question, and it certainly is important because anxiety is a part of many people's lives, and perhaps they don't even realize what is bringing about the anxiety. But this is an important question, where to turn to, because obviously anxiety on the part of a person has an effect upon every aspect of their life, upon their health, upon their family, and upon their work, and their relationship with others. It has, it has an effect, sometimes a very devastating effect. But I believe that you are headed in the right direction by realizing that you have the problem. And I believe that you need to be looking into it closely to try to determine just exactly what is causing this problem of anxiety. Because there has to be something that, that brings it about. Webster defines anxiety as a state of being uneasy or worried about what may happen. Now it could be over something that has already happened or something that is happening now. Of course it can involve what may happen. Now we can't uh, predict the future. We don't know what the future holds, but we can deal with things as they are now. And so the best place to turn is to turn to, to God. And in any case, we need to get hold of the matter. And so if you're a child of God, then you have that privilege to look to Him. You have that privilege to pray. You have that privilege to just simply put your trust and your confidence in Him. But I want to emphasize again, look into this closely and see what is determining your, your problem. Now, in order to be a Christian, this has already been expressed by Brother uh, Kali in his, the previous question in becoming a Christian. Certainly one must hear the Word of God, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. One must then repent of every sin. In Luke 3 and, and 5, and uh, Luke 3, 3 and 5, I tell you nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. One must confess faith in Christ. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Like the Ethiopian eunuch then, when he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. And then to take away all past sins, to be baptized into Christ, where the blood of Christ 
cleanse us from sin. Acts 2.38, when Peter told the people on the day of Pentecost to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. If you're not a child of God, these are steps that must be taken. But if you are God's child, you certainly have the right. And I would want to encourage you to become a Christian if you aren't, so that you will have Him with you and you can turn to Him in prayer and, and thanksgiving. I might suggest this also, that in order to help you arrive at the cause of your problem, it might be good to consult a faithful Christian counselor. Now, I mean a faithful Christian counselor, not just any counselor, but someone who believes the Bible, who believes in God, and who believes that the Bible is the truth and that the Bible is to direct our lives. So a faithful Christian counselor, this certainly might help. And I want you to know that if we can be of any further assistance to you, please let us know. But thank you for this question. It's such an important one. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer to you a free tract. Our tract today is What is So Important About Jesus' Resurrection. We're also offering our free eight-lesson Bible Correspondence Course. If you'd like the course, we will send you the first lesson. Study it in hand with your Bible. Uh, fill out the questions on the back. Send that back page to us. We'll grade it. Send you lesson two. If you complete all eight lessons in the course, we'll send you a certificate of completion. Also, please send us your Bible question. And you can do that by writing us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. Or you can email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net. Or you can call our toll-free number and uh, give us your address and we'll see to meet your request. That's 1-800-436-0463. You can also contact us by means of our webpage, www.abibleanswertv.com. We're having more and more people go to our webpage. We want to encourage you to take a look at it. We have a contact page there where you can let us know your request or send us your question. Also, all of our past programs are archived there for you to watch again. And you can also uh, look at each program and the scripts there and search them for questions you would like to hear answered. Back to our questions. Now for Brother Gulledge's first question today. The person asked, was Jonah actually swallowed by a whale or by something else? Some say that whale in Matthew's twel Matthew 1240 is not the correct rendering. Brother Gulledge. This is a question that has actually been asked by several people for several years. People have, for a long time now, wanted to know what kind of, what kind of fish was Jonah swallowed by. And Some say that it was a well, some say that it wasn't a well. Some scientists have even gone as far as to study the different types of well that we have in existence today and, and find out if there are any that can actually swallow a, a human being whole and and can a human being actually fit in the stomach of these wells? And, and there's actually been a lot of study done to, to see what kind of well it might have been. Uh, but whenever you and I turn to the book of Jonah, we see in chapter 1 and verse 17 where God sent what, what says a large fish or a fish to swallow uh, Jonah. In chapter 2 and verse 1, we read that Jonah is in the belly of the fish and he's praying. Uh, and so whenever we take that word fish in the book of Jonah there, 1, 17 and 2 and verse 1, we take that word fish. In the Hebrew, that word fish there means as defined, quote, sea monster, end quote. Uh, so it was some kind of sea monster. Now, what kind was it? Uh, we really do not know what kind it was. It was just one that was sent by God. Uh, the Hebrew word there translated sea monster. The Greek word, or the Greek term rather, when you turn to the New Testament, Matthew 12 and verse 40, the Greek term translated as sea monster uh, refers to a sea creature that is, quote, undefined in its species. And so it doesn't have, we, we don't have the definition, or we re, rather we don't have the species uh, defined for us. It's undefined in the, in the Greek there in Matthew 12 and verse 40. Uh, so it does not necessarily refer to a well 
as the King James has it translated. Some commentators that I read uh, about Matthew 12 and verse 40 said that whenever that was translated, it was an effort in translation in order to bring about what you and I might know uh, today as a whale or a big fish. And so it's not exactly the proper or the correct translation, but it was an effort in translation uh, for you and I today as a whale. And so was it a whale that you and I have today? We don't know. Most likely not. Uh, but it was a sea creature. It was a sea monster as the Hebrew and the Greek term define it as. Now, I, I want to say this as we think about this question because many people have asked it and a lot of people want to know. Uh, I want to suggest that the miracle here in the account of Jonah is not what type of fish it was. And it's not even the fact that this fish swallowed Jonah, a whole man. That's not really the miracle here. The miracle here is the fact that Jonah was allowed and able to stay alive for three days in the belly of a fish. That's the miracle. That's the, that's the amazing part here of the account of the fish. So what type of fish it was, we don't know. But it was a sea creature sent uh, by God. And so identifying the exact sea creature that the Lord appointed to swallow Jonah is neither possible uh, and I would suggest necessary. We don't know and it's really not that important. And I hope this answers your question. Thank you, Brother Gulledge. Uh, I recall that in the book of Jonah, there are three things that God is said to have prepared. God is said to have prepared a great fish. God is said to have prepared a gourd. And God is said to have prepared a wind. I believe the same Hebrew word for prepared is used in all three of those instances. God prepared those three things in the book of Jonah. And we can be rest assured to know that anything that God prepares will get the job done. And so it did in the book of Jonah. Brother Colley, we have this question. Did Jesus live before he was born of a virgin? Brother Colley. We generally try to understand things by our own wisdom and our own knowledge and experience. But of course, some things God has done that we cannot explain in our own wisdom, in our own time. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, but he hath in these last days spoken unto us through his Son, whom he gave to be the heir over all things, through whom he made the world. In Matthew 3, 17, at his baptism, the Father thundered forth from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. On the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So we understand Jesus was there when the Father claimed him to be his Son. In Galatians 4 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, that he might redeem them that are under the law. In John 1, verse 1 through 4, he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him not anything was made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In John 1, 14, he says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Did Jesus live before he was born of a virgin is the question. And the answer is yes. You know, in John 8, verse 56 through 59, your father Abraham, he said, rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. And then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, listen to this closely. Before Abraham was, I am. And then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Was Jesus in existence before he was born of a virgin? Absolutely. In fact, he is divine just like God, just like the Holy Spirit. That means they are eternal beings. Thank you for this question. 
We hope this helps to answer it. Thank you. Brother Colbert, a person asks, what is the nature of, and they have this in quote marks, the great white throne judgment? Is this only for the laws to determine their degree of punishment? We'll give that to you, Brother, Col Brother uh, Colbert. Well, this is an interesting question. I don't know that I've heard anybody ask this question myself before, perhaps. I'm sure it has been asked or it wouldn't be somebody's question now. But I have searched in a good concordance and I have not been able to find any expression in the Bible, great white throne judgment. I believe that expression is a figment of somebody's imagination. It's of human origin. But perhaps this idea grows out of Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15 especially. I would remind us that the book of Revelation is written in highly symbolical language, and that was done for a purpose. In Revelation 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now there are a couple of things there that we need to emphasize is things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it. So the book is highly symbolical. So in Revelation chapter 20, and let's begin at verse 11. Now, prior to this, it speaks of the false prophet, the beast and the false prophet being cast into the lake of fire and brimstone and being tormented for day and night forever and ever. And then John wrote these words. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it. Now that doesn't say anything about a great white throne judgment. It says, I saw a great white throne. Remember the symbolical language and images in the book. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in them, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, certainly in this reading there is reference to the judgment. Now it's not called here the great white throne judgment to determine the degree of punishment for the lost. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches that matter. But this passage does teach that we're all going to be judged. Notice, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, implied here is that those who are found written, and implied would be there will be those found written in the book of life. And so those who are found written in the book of life will not be cast into the lake of fire. So the judgment determines who's saved and who's lost. And it's as though it were the, like the court pronouncing the sentence. We're really judged by the life that we live according to the Word of God, John 12, verse 48. But in uh, rather John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, the Bible says that the hour is coming and that which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They that have done good on the resurrection of life, they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. And there are many other passages of Scripture 
that teach that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For example, Romans chapter 14, verse 10 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. All of these passages show that there will be the general judgment of both the saved and the lost. And there is no great white throne judgment pictured in the Bible to determine the degree of punishment for the lost. I hope this answer has been helpful and we appreciate this good question. We are thankful to Brother Colley and Brother Colbert and Brother Gulledge for doing such a good job today in answering uh, your questions. Uh, perhaps their answers have uh, intrigued you and created another question in your mind that you'd like to ask. Uh, we do hope that our viewers will send us in questions. We're always in need of good questions. I was looking at this uh, passage and Brother Colbert did a, a great job in answering that. You know, in verse 12 it says, I saw the dead, small and great. Stand before God. Well, that's everyone, isn't it? The dead, small, and great. And then further it says in verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And hell there is not a good translation in the King James. The American Standard translates that better. Uh, it's translated as Hades. And so Hades is the place where departed spirits go to await uh, the judgment. So here you have the spirits uh, in Hades and uh, death and Hades are cast into the lake of fire. Why is that? Because death is no more and uh, Hades, which is a temporary place, is no more. The spirits have returned. They have been resurrected with their bodies and everyone is there at the judgment awaiting final resting place. And then as Brother Colbert said, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. But as he said, that implies there were those that were written in the book of life and they were not cast in the lake of fire. There's no such thing in the Bible as two judgments. It's appointed a man once to die and after this, the judgment. There's only one and not two. So we're thankful for the one who sent that question in and we're grateful to these brethren for the good job they've done today in answering your questions. Thanks so much for watching a Bible Answer today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible Answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.